Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy in the second chapter. Paul was under house arrest in Rome. He was never to be free again. And he was writing letters back to various of those that had uh, worshipped with him, those that he considered his children in the faith, and churches that he was concerned about and where he had labored. I think that Timothy was one of his dearest. I think Timothy was a very, very able, good, young preacher. And Paul was trying to help him, encourage him, and instruct him for the last times of the things that he needed to know. We talked Wednesday night about discipleship. And I, I never really got it out of my mind since then. And, and I thought on those things and how important it is that we teach our young people the ways of God, that we warn them of the uh, pitfalls that can befall them, that we instruct them and tell them that things are not always going to be easy in this walk and sometimes they're going to be very, very hard. Uh, I grow weary with uh, the New Age religion, and if you accept Christ, then you're going to be wealthy. You're, you're not going to be uh, sick. You're, you're not going to have problems. The Lord is going to just take all of those things away. The Scriptures teach nothing of that sort. Our Lord taught nothing of that sort. He says, if you follow me, you need to take up your own cross. And if you follow me, you're going to suffer persecution. And I think that's a, a lot of the problem that our, our young people uh, run into today uh, when they have been saved and uh, baptized and are members of the Lord's church and they begin to encounter problems and they begin to fall away. They have been falling away now at an alarming rate for decades in our churches. Uh, Brother Danny, in our age group, there's a great falling away. And Sister Laura mentioned Wednesday night how many 20-something that was baptized around the time that she was and how many was still here. She's the only one, Brother Brad, is pastoring. That, that, that's wonderful. He's doing what he needs to do, but she's the only one left. We've got some serious gaps here in this church, as in many of the churches, and it should be alarming to us. And wonder why uh, those gaps exist. Now, I'd like to read uh, 2 Timothy a second chapter, the first through the fourth verse. Now therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, I said we need to uh, alert our young people in that this walk is not easy. But I will go further to say that a walk of anyone in this life is not easy. 
And we attribute many things to serving God, which is just uh, what all mankind have to deal with and endure and go through. It's because of sin entering into this world what has caused all of the problems that we have and is still doing it today. So uh, to uh, not serve God doesn't mean that everything's gonna be easy either. It just means you're not gonna have the Lord uh, helping you. He's not gonna be walking with you and he's not gonna be directing you in your life that you are uh, presently uh, living. Now Paul talks to Timothy uh, in some pretty strong language. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul talks about being engaged in a spiritual battle. Uh, it wasn't that he was merely an, I an illustration. He was uh, speaking in reality. In the Ephesian letter, he talks about putting on the whole armor of God. Uh, he talks about uh, many things. He addresses other uh, men uh, as uh, fellow Soldiers are good soldiers. Uh, as the, the, the children's song says, we are in, the God, in God's army now. Now, those things would all indicate that uh, this is not going to be easy. And I don't want to drive yet our young people away further uh, and... Uh, you be discouraged and go out into the world because in the world, it's not easy either. Now, Paul was concerned about Timothy. Paul loved Timothy. Not only was he concerned about Timothy and the others, he was concerned about the work that he had begun and he wanted to see it to fruition, and he wanted to know that it went on after that he was gone. He wanted to know that after that he died, uh, that the work was going to flourish and do well. Isn't that not what we all want? I'm not saying that we have sacrificed anything, but I'm saying that our lives, Maurice and I's lives, were drastically changed because of this work. Completely changed, and uh, most of our uh, dreams uh, just had to be dashed upon a stone. And, yeah, and you've labored too, and you've labored hard in this church. You've sacrificed, you've given of uh, your lives, you've given of your money, you've given of your time, you're given of all of these things. And uh, to see that it all come to naught, I want to see it do well. I don't want to see anything skip a beat the day that I die. I don't want to even uh, see a stutter. And, and I don't think you, you do or should either. Now, the mindset has been for all of these decades that I have talked about, and I don't know what it was like before the decades that I uh, know about and, and am familiar with. It was, let's fly in here in June or July or August. Uh, let's have us a big meeting and let's get as many people saved as we can and let's baptize them, Period. If we've done that, it's been a roaring success. Well, those things are wonderful. There's nothing greater upon the face of the earth than being saved by God's grace and witnessing those around you of being saved. But the, the comment that I remember hearing, well, the devil can't touch them now. Well, their soul, that's true. The devil can't touch them. If they've truly been saved by God's grace, they're going to heaven. Uh, nothing can change that. And I am so very thankful for uh, the security of the saints. If that were not so, then I would be greatly, greatly troubled for the masses that tell us that they've been saved by God's grace and in the lives they live after. Now, 
The devil cannot touch their souls, and I, and I don't care what the devil tries to do, he cannot do that. But the devil can destroy their lives. Are you willing to see your children saved and baptized and then watch the devil come in and destroy them? Our Lord told Peter, he said, the devil desires to sift you like wheat. Now, I want to talk about how they uh, sifted wheat uh, at the time that our Lord made that comment. They would lay the wheat on a stone floor or an or a earthen floor that had been beat down and was almost like stone. And they would take a flail and they'd begin to beat the wheat over and over and over again. They would beat it mercilessly. They would beat it uh, with uh, uh, reckless abandon. They would take that flail and they would beat and they would beat and they would beat until they got the grain uh, away from uh, the rest of the plant. Now that's what our Lord said that the devil would do to Peter if he had the opportunity and that's exactly what he wants to do to those people that get saved and are baptized. He wants to sift them as wheat. Now, when a person becomes baptized, truly saved and baptized, then they become a target. And I believe that uh, the devil's motivation is that God not receive honor and glory. If he can stop anything, anyone from praising God, he is going to do that. It says in the scriptures, uh, in the church to God be the honor and the glory. Now, if uh, if even after that they are saved and baptized and they leave this building and, and come as long as their parents make them come and then when they get to the age that you can't tell them anymore that they're gone or, or maybe they don't ever return at all. They don't ever come back to the Lord's house to give him honor and glory. Do you remember the 10 lepers that our Lord healed? Uh, how that nine went on about their ways, went on about their lives after being completely healed and only the one came back and bowed down and thanked the Lord uh, for the healing powers. Now, I agree that they are equipped for anything. When the Lord saves them and they follow the Lord in baptism, I, I believe they're equipped to handle Satan and and anything that the world could have for them. But I want to go a little further here before we draw any uh, concrete conclusions. Uh, we, we look over in the last uh, part of uh, Matthew uh, and the, the, the Great Commission. That's our responsibility. Uh, that's what he told the church. I don't believe he was just telling those few uh, people that were there. I believe he was telling the church that had already been established. He was telling them what their responsibility was, and we need to understand that responsibility. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Uh, that is, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to every creature, to every man. Who can tell what shall prosper? May it all be alike good. That it's your responsibility to preach to everyone and not go to a few or, or who you want to hear it but a preach to everybody and then when that happens I then baptize them that's what they did that's what Paul did to uh, the uh, jailer that night there's nothing wrong with the church's authority when someone is saved and they say, I want to go right now and be baptized. I think that's the time to do it. We can find that many places. And it is not preached that the importance of baptism, it is not preached the importance as it ought to be. It's important that you follow the Lord in baptism because he commanded it not to be saved because that's the first commandment he gives anyone after that he has saved their soul. And then 
teaching them to observe all things. Now, let's, let's think about it in terms of uh, someone joining the Marines or the Army or Air Force or Navy or, or, or whatever branch of military that we are familiar with. And then when, when a person is saved, we, we can see that as not necessarily taking an oath, but we can see that as someone that, uh, that has submitted to the Lord, uh, that has uh, repented of their sins and believed with all their heart. At that point, they become a child of God. And then they, they follow the Lord in, in baptism. They, they submit to that because the Lord has saved them and I'm following the Lord in baptism. I'm showing forth his death, burial, and resurrection. We can see that as a soldier that uh, has uh, uh, taken an oath and then he's putting on the uniform. Showing the world. I'm in the Lord's army. I'm on his side. I have committed my all to him. I'm no longer uh, the owner or possessor of my own body, but he owns it now. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, one day I shall rise as well. Whipped to the fullest. You're ready now, go fight. That's the approach we've taken. You're ready now, go for it. Equipped, but not at all ready. Can you imagine the armed forces? Can you imagine especially you uh, that were in one of those armed forces that you uh, took the oath, that you put on the uniform, and they says, you're ready now. You go fight. Really? I've got you completely equipped and it takes thousands and thousands of dollars now to equip a modern soldier. A lot more than it just handing him a gun, but let's just think about it like in Civil War days or, or a time like that, a revolutionary. Hand him a gun. You're ready to fight. And we can find even in George Washington's army that they went out and failed miserably. They brought a, a man in there to train his soldiers and they became a viable fighting force. But without the training, uh, without the understanding of even how, and, and I was watching something this morning and they were talking about an instance that happened. They didn't understand exactly how to load uh, their weapon. And it caused a great deal of problem. You hand a man a gun and don't tell him how to load it. You don't tell him uh, how to uh, use it. Uh, you don't tell him how to fight. You don't tell him how uh, to follow orders. You don't instruct him in all of those things. Why? He's going to fail miserably. And that is what has happened with most of our people. They have failed miserably because they were completely equipped. They were ready to go, but they were not trained. Now, many of you have gone through basic training. I hear that it's very tough. And no doubt at the time you probably complained greatly among yourself and other soldiers. Why are they putting us through this? Why are they doing this to us? Why are they making it so hard on us? They did that to save your life. They did that so you would not be killed yourself. That's why they were so tough. Now, Paul told Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace 
that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses and the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. He's saying, remember what I told you, Timothy. If you're going to endure hardness as a good soldier, you've got to take into account, you've got to embrace, and you've got to practice what I have told you. If you don't, you cannot endure hardness at all. That is discipleship. We talked about that Wednesday night. Paul was taught not only of the Lord, but Ananias and others that he was around. And he taught Timothy. And he says, Timothy, you do what I tell you to do. You, you, you do the things that I've instructed you to do and the training that I have given you. And then you can tell others. And then they can yet tell others what they need to do. Been doing that for 2,000 years minus Obviously, maybe a few decades that I'm aware of. I, I agree that if people are not saved, there is no, there is no chance for the church to per per perpetuate itself. And I agree if people do not follow the Lord in baptism... There is no way that the church can perpetuate itself. I agree. I mean, that, that's obvious. One man once said, and I, I've quoted it a, a number of times, for the church to give up the desire to perpetuate itself gives up the desire to exist. And just come to accept that this is the end of all things and, and there's nothing else that we can do. How horrible is that? How horrible is that? But I want to go a step further. We can have a wonderful revival. Everybody in here saved. Others come in, get saved. Everybody submit to baptism. And everybody follow us to the creek or right down here in the baptistry and, and follow the Lord in baptism. If we fail to teach them, the church still cannot perpetuate itself. There must be doctrines. There must be things taught to these people that they must have an understanding of the way that these things work. What we'll have is a house full of people that are trying to do other things, trying to follow other methods, trying to even follow even other spirits. I gave the definition Wednesday night of disciples, one who embraces and assists in spreading the teachings of another. That's what we were looking for. We were looking for help. That's what our Lord says, pray for. Pray for help that the fields are white and ready for harvest. Someone that actively gets involved, not someone that drags in two or three times a year. I'm thankful they're here, but, but it's no help, no help. We are looking for those that are willing to get their hands dirty. We're looking for those that are willing to work. We're looking for those that are committed to the cause of Jesus Christ and realize that their body is not their own. It was paid for with a price by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are not our own, people. We no longer own or possess ourselves that we are owned and possessed by our Lord Jesus Christ, and he has the right. When you uh, called upon him for salvation, you repented and you surrendered and you yielded. You didn't just give up your soul, you give up your body as well. Give it all up. And then people will just take part of it back. A people, a people, one that wants to learn, 
one that has teachers that wants to teach, uh, one that wants to uh, understand everything that they can about the Lord. And, and the more they understand, the more that they are apt to be able to uh, do what God would have for them to do. And, and the more influence they're gonna have on uh, more people. Someone asks you about salvation. And they'll say, well, let, let me take you to my preacher. Pretty much lost them by then. Let me just take you to my preacher. He'll tell you. Or better yet, come to one of our services and, and maybe just maybe he'll preach on that next Sunday. Mm -mm. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to know it yourselves. And it's our responsibility to teach each and every one of these disciples that uh, have uh, uh, been saved and baptized and members of the Lord's church uh, teach them to be able uh, to uh, give an account of what the Lord has done for them in their heart to anyone that might ask or anyone that you feel like you need to tell. It's your responsibility, not just mine. Now, a person for the most part is uh, used to sitting on a couch and playing video games. It looked like it'd be a lot of fun. I, I remembered when that, that Pong game started. We were young. You know, I had just boop, boop. And I thought, how can they ever improve on this? That is amazing. I'd have probably been involved in some of that as a boy. I have no interest now. I don't know if I would have or not. But that's pretty much what their life is, even up to the time they sign on the dotted line and they give the oath to join the Army or Air Force or Navy or whatever that it is. Now, you take that person right off his couch and set him in a foxhole somewhere with bombs going off around him and bullets going over him, what do you think that boy is going to do or girl? I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anyone. What do you think that person is going to do right off the couch, right in the foxhole with all of that going on? They're going to curl up in a ball in a fetal position with their thumb in their mouth. Crying because they're in the situation they're in. So is it wrong to teach them? Yes, it's hard. Is it wrong to teach them and instruct them in the things? Soft and undisciplined. That's what we've done. Or is it more kind to be tough and make them ready for battle? It is kind, and it is altogether kind to our children to teach them the things of God. I mean, I see people that don't come back to church. They don't look happy to me. They don't look content to me. Their life, for the most part, is a wreck and their children have never heard the gospel, and their lives are just whirling out of control. The family's gone at that point. If you miss one generation, you've affected 10 Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Whose responsibility is it to teach discipleship? 
to our people. You say, well, it's yours. Well, they hear me from 30 to, well, maybe now close to 40 minutes. Maybe more. A week. They're in Sunday school, less than an hour of teaching. That is not sufficient. That is in no way sufficient. Let's look over to Deuteronomy. In the 11th chapter. Therefore shall you lay up uh, these my words in your heart and in your soul. That's the parent he's talking about. Laying up in your heart and your soul and bind them for a sign upon your head that they may be as frontlets between your eyes that your children may see exactly what you are. And I can guarantee you one thing. You may be thinking you're faking it today. You may not be following the Lord. You may not have the Lord focused in your life. You may not be doing the things the Lord would have for you to do. You may be seeking out all those other things. I can guarantee your children know exactly what and who you are. You're not fooling them for a minute. They are most perceptive in those things. I mentioned in the minister school when I was a kid, my mama would use a pressure cooker. She would turn it on and that thing would start popping. Be careful. Walk softly. This house may just explode. And I wasn't more than five, six years old, and I was thinking, why in the world would you set a ticking time bomb in our kitchen? <laughs> what are you thinking? I went in their house the other day. That thing was a popping again. And I thought, I'm just going to walk right out. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to be a party of this anymore. They know all those things. You're not, you're not fooling them. You may even fool me, but you're not going to fool them. They're with you all the time. Hopefully uh, more than uh, they are now. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them, when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest dead, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thy house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them. For as the days of heaven upon the earth. You know, you've heard this, the saying, heaven on earth. He's promising that. The Lord has promised that to his, to each and every one of us as parents. That it may be as heaven upon the earth. What is that? Teaching them the things of God. Making disciples of them. You say, well, they're not saved yet. Well, you need to start just as soon as they can. Just as soon as they can understand anything. The first memories they should have are you praying and taking them to church. And it's amazing how fast they grow up. And on the court across the way last night, I looked over there and Walter Murphy was dribbling a basketball. I thought, wow. Jerry Reynolds even went over there to witness it. He, he telling me about it. And I looked over there. I never seen anything like that in my whole life. He was doing it with pretty good proficiency. What our Lord's saying here in Deuteronomy, you teach your children that they might live by those things and you're going to have heaven on earth. What happens when you don't teach those things? Well, I'm not going to say what you're going to have on earth, but it's not going to be heaven. You're going to raise your children and then spend the rest of your life in regret because of watching their lives and watching them deteriorate around you. Right?
right in front of you. One problem right after the other. One disaster right after the other. You're not going to find any peace. You're not going to find any rest because your children are constantly in trouble. I'm not saying all your problems go away. We've done talked about that. But I'm saying uh, that uh, your chances are far better uh, to teach them the things of God and bring them up as they Lord would have for them too. Yes, I'll try to do my part. And yes, our Sunday school teachers, they're doing their part as well. But yes, you must take your responsibility. Train them from a very, very young age. And then when, the, when they get to the age of accountability and they get saved, they're gonna have a whole storehouse of stuff they already know. They're, they're gonna know so much by the time they're eight or 10 years old or 12 or whenever the Lord saves their soul or whatever age that it is, they're going to be well on their way to knowing uh, many things that others do not know. That is the advantages of taking your children to church. You say, well, I, I've heard it. I, I, I get so discouraged. My child's been on the altar for five years and parents will fly in here and I remember seeing that too. Parents will fly in here once every two or three years or so and their children will fall down and get saved. And it's like, really? Hold on. Don't, don't give up. Don't give up on the Lord and don't give up on your children. Because you have been bringing them and teaching them and they have been hopefully immersed in it and, and they've got an understanding of the way that the Lord's church works. Not only will they be equipped for anything, they will know more how to use the equipment when you put it in their hands. The Lord says, Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. That's what they can expect. As a young lamb, babes in Christ, among wolves. That's why he stressed discipleship. That's why Paul stressed it. That's why the other stressed it. John talks about... Uh, Gaius, in the third John, referred to him, I think, as his son as well, in the faith. That's why they were not just preaching the gospel, and that is just not our responsibility, but uh, uh, stressing the importance of baptism and then teaching them everything. Uh, other religions teach their children far better than we do. We have the truth and hardly do any teaching whatsoever. By the time they are 12 or 13 years old, they can recite the doctrines of the, of the group that they are affiliated with and they know more than some of our people know in churches that I have been in that deacons of 75 years old. Still tottering around like babies, wanting attention, wanting you to pet them. Being offended at every little thing. Not doing anything for the Lord's cause. That's not what we need either. Like I said Wednesday night, I'm not really into petting that much. Me and Isaac would play horse from a very young age. And uh, maybe I was wrong, but I didn't let him win. Didn't let him win. Never did let him win. But boy, you should have seen the day that he won. What a glorious day that was. 
And I had to yield to him. And then I had to continue yielding to him because he kept beating me. Same way with Noah. He's in high school. Wouldn't let him win either. But the first day he beat me, I will never hear the end of it. He will never let me live it down. I says, I beat you a thousand times. You beat me three times and, I, and it's all I ever hear. But there's going to come a day when I will not beat him again. You know what I want? I want our young people to be stronger than you and I. I want them to be tougher than you and I. I want them to be more knowledgeable than you and I. I want them to be braver than you and I. Fearless, more fearless than you and I. That's what I want for them. I want them to beat me. And I want them to beat you. Is it? Fair not to train them. I think it's downright cruel not to train them. I think we're doing them a great disservice. And if you want to see your grandchildren saved, you better teach your children. You better do it well. That's not going to guarantee anything. But if you do not teach your children well and they get gone... There's not a whole lot of hope for your grandchildren. Discipleship. That's what we've got to do. I don't care how many old time Baptists have never taught it. It's time we teach it now. I, I believe in our way. Lord led me here. Lord led me places just like here that teaches just like you do. But there are things that we have failed in and this is one of the grand ones. This is one of the big ones. In teaching discipleship to those that are follow after us. He goes on to say, No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. I think he's referring a lot to Roman soldiers at this time. It was the most viable fighting force the world had ever seen. They weren't allowed to have any other, any other occupations. If you're a soldier, that's all you're going to do. You're going to wait for the captain to give his orders and you're going to obey them. Now I know you've got other things you've got to do and you've got to take care of your family and you've got to do all of those things. I understand that. That's not what I'm saying here. Uh, but there has got to be some dedication. There's got to be some loyalty. There's got to be some something in our young people uh, to, that they feel the responsibility to follow the Lord. I don't know exactly altogether how to get there, but it has got to happen. I'm working on it. And that's my, that's my message. 